Many of us prayed for Cindy. We prayed for healing. We prayed for full recovery. And not only, I don't know about you, but I always pray for more. I don't want, want people just to recover. I want people to be transformed. I pray for something more every time. And I know a lot of you prayed for something more. Not only a physical recovery, but a spiritual, I don't know, something that would happen in her life. That would be a testimony, a story, a witness. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And last week I talked about one of the things that the cross does for us is it takes our sense of power and it turns it upside down. All the ways that we want things to happen, all of our expectations, all of the ways in which we want life to happen for us and for others, and the ways that we try to get that to happen, the cross takes that and turns it upside down in some strange ways. And it takes a lifetime, actually it takes an eternity <laughs> to start to figure that out because God works in such different ways than we do. And please, please, please understand that I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray with all of our being when someone is sick, when we see God's will being played out in somebody's life, or we see people struggling. We pray with every ounce of our being, and that's something that we learn to do step by step, day by day, to trust with every cell in our body, with every spiritual cell in our soul, to trust God implicitly, that God actually is good. It's not just something we glibly say off of our tongues, but he is good all the time. And no matter what the world may look like, things may fall apart, just like we sang. He's still ours, and he is still for us. And the weakness that seems so apparent Paul calls God's power and strength. Or the foolishness that seems so apparent, Paul calls the wisdom of God. God's power works in different ways. And part of our learning and our trusting and faith is that no matter how things may look, no matter how dark they may seem, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And as the psalmist says, the night around him turns to day. Light and darkness to God are both alike because wherever God is, that is light. That room, that island, that country, that world is filled with the light of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus dares to say, and he points to his followers and he says, and you are the light of the world. If he were here today, he would say, and you are the lighthouses of this world. Let your light so shine before all people that they may see the good things that you do, not so much the word that you say, the good things that you do that speak of my Father. And there's something that comes through to us when we experience the sadness and loss of someone that we know and love. And that is the steadfastness of the God of grace, the one who holds the universe, the stars together in his love. The second lesson on the cross is not so much about power, but it's about a promise. It's about a promise of God to us that no matter what suffering you may go through in this life, you are never alone. So the cross of Jesus Christ speaks to us of a man who is broken and crucified and weak and bleeding and dying. And Jesus talked about the cross like it was his throne. 
He said, when I'm lifted up, and he's talking about the cross, but it sounds like a king saying, when he is lifted up to his place of honor, I will what? I will draw all people to myself. Did he say just a few people? Or just those who go to church? Or those who, who like Pastor Scott? Or people who um, talk the correct theology and all this? No, I will draw all people to myself. And that is something that God is doing constantly, every day, every night. He is drawing. He is calling to every person in your family and mine. He's calling to every person on this island. He is drawing people to himself. And we're simply here to encourage people that, hey, there is that voice of love that is calling you, that is drawing you to himself. And one of the most powerful things we can say to people is that you are not alone. No matter what you go through, no matter what kinds of things are in your life, you are not ever alone. Because God understands your suffering. That God brings that suffering into his heart, too, and shares that suffering and aligns himself with your pain. The Bible tells us about that. Even in the Old Testament, we have shadows of, of Jesus on the cross, of God suffering and bringing his, that pain into his heart and sharing it intimately. The conversation Moses has at the burning bush with Yahweh, as God is talking to him out of the bush in the third chapter of Exodus, God says some powerful, powerful stuff. God says, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry because of their oppressors. And then catch this. And most of your Bibles say something wimpy, like, and I am aware of their suffering. I am aware of their suffering. That is one of the wimpiest translations of the Hebrew word there that I've ever seen. What it should say is, I am intimately experiencing their suffering. Because the word that is used there in the Hebrew is the word yada. Say it with me. Yada. Say it like with some gusto. Yada. Okay. Yada means a love and a faithfulness that is intimate. Sometimes the word is used for relations between men and women, husband and wife. It's about intimacy. It's about an intimate experience. And God says, I intimately experience their pain. And the word pain in the Hebrew is interesting too because it's not only, it's, it can be physical pain, it can be mental anguish, it can be spiritual pain, whatever suffering somebody is going through. The word literally means to be bowed down. Whether it's under the lash of an oppressor or your own depression or whatever you're going through, God intimately feels that. He feels our pain, every ounce of it. There's not a drop, not a tear that is wasted that God hasn't shed a million tears because he feels your pain. But we feel so alone. We feel so alone. Skip ahead a number of uh, centuries in time and imagine Israel, they're displaced, they're in Babylon. They no longer are in their, their home country, no more temple, no more God in the land. They're in a foreign land. And they cry out to God and they go, how long, how long do we have to stay here? When can we go home? And they cry out to God in the 49th chapter of Isaiah. And they say, you've forgotten us. You've totally forgotten us. What's going on? And in that still, small voice, that whisper of the, I believe it was the second person of the Trinity, Jesus before he had a body, Christ. I believe it was the whisper of the second person of the Trinity who said, 
Can a woman forget her nursing child? Can a woman forget her nursing child? And even she may forget, but I will never, ever forget you. Ever. And he says, see, I have you inscribed on the palms of my hands. Your walls are always before me. The palms of my hands. You are inscribed on the palms of my hands. Your pain is inscribed on the palms of my hands. This is not a God who is far off and distant. Greek philosophy would have us believe that. I mean, there's some truth to that, and the, you know, God is beyond us and all of that. But the Greeks took it to, uh, Plato and all the rest took it to uh, a far further extent than the Bible ever would. God is beyond us, but God is not a God who is unmoved by our pain, by our disasters. Even when they're self-caused, he is not unmoved. Another place in Isaiah that you're familiar with, I'm sure. In Isaiah 53, you've heard this before. It's around Easter time, Palm Sunday or Good Friday. Isaiah 53, surely our, our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our shalom, the chastening of our shalom fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. He carries our sorrows. He carries our brokenness. He takes inside of himself like some sort of cosmic sponge. He draws our pain inside of him and he carries it with a confidence in his Father that he will have the strength to do that. That's what the cross tells us. That we not only have a friend like the song says, what a friend we have in Jesus. He not only walks alongside of us, he carries us and more importantly, he carries the very pain that threatens to tear our lives apart. At least it feels like that. The cross reminds us that God is not distant. He is as close as our next breath. He is as close as our next heartbeat. And he sticks with us. He sticks with us like glue like love, like the power that held Jesus' body against two hard pieces of wood. That's the power of the cross. Other places where God comes up, it's in the many descriptions of Jesus' miracles and his works where it mentions the word compassion. Compassion that gut feeling deep down inside where you are linked up with another person. It's not just sympathy. Oh, that's too bad. God doesn't do sympathy. But God does compassion. Where his heart is linked to ours. And wherever we are in the life journey, that God's heart, he goes, I know exactly what you're feeling. And he can say it. Not like we can, well, yeah, I know how you're feeling. And people go, no, you don't. <laughs> Not really. But God can say it. God can say, I know how you're feeling. Because God knows the depth of our brokenness better than we do. And he doesn't resist it or push it away. He takes it all in. He takes it all in. There's so many stories, but the one that I like the best is in Matthew 14. It's about in the middle of the chapter, about the 13th verse. Jesus has just learned that his cousin, 
has not only been illegally imprisoned, but he's been brutally killed. Why would the Father allow this? I'm sure he prayed for John. Why would God allow this, such a brutal, horrible, evil thing to happen? So political, so egotistical. Why, why, why? And Jesus is coming off of this, and he's human, and he feels the grief. He feels the loss. John has been snatched out. And so, what does he do? He comes to shore, and he sees people, and he has compassion on them. He doesn't have any strength left, but he has compassion on them. He feels something because he feels their sense of chaos and wandering. They don't have a shepherd. They don't have somebody. They're all alone. They're sheep wandering around. And he has compassion. And he heals them. And then he goes on to make the greatest celebration, the greatest feeding in history. But I lock in to the compassion. And that's how Jesus looks at us. You know, we're, some days we're doing really great. Great to have you on board, Jesus. All right, you know, co-pilot or whatever you make him. Um, he's happy to sit in whatever seat. Um, just invite him along, please. He'd like to be in the pilot seat, but whatever, wherever we're at. And we're feeling good on a certain day. Other days, we can barely get out of bed. Stuff is heavy on us. We can barely move. And we feel so utterly alone until, quite by surprise, there's a little spark inside, a little whisper, a little tap on the shoulder that says, hey, I'm still here and I'll never let you go. I want to read this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Paul wrestles with this. This sense of what does it mean to enter into suffering. Uh, in the book of Philippians, in the third chapter, the 10th verse, Paul talks about entering into the power of God's resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection, and the fellowship, catch this, the fellowship of his sufferings, the koinonia of his sufferings, that close friendship. Reminds me of St. Francis, you know, brother sun, sister moon, brother um, hunger, you know, sister, sister feet hurting, and, and all this. St. Francis accepted things in life as companions to him, that God had his life fully in his hand. And there was nothing that could happen to Francis. And so they were all brothers and sisters to him, even the painful part, the suffering part. And Paul wrestles with this too. And he says, see, make sure I get the verses right, 5 through 7, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, Listen to this now. It is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so you are sharers of our comfort. There's something mystical, okay, mysterious about this sharing of suffering. That we really aren't alone, and it isn't just God. It isn't just Jesus on the cross, but it is those who have embraced the cross of Christ, have embraced the sufferings of our fellow human beings. That's part of the package. When Dot is baptized next week, she not only agrees to be part of the powerful, wonderful, abundant living that Jesus has, but part of that package is to have a greater sensitivity to the sufferings of others. 
whether they be on the island, in her own family, um, all around the world. You can't read a newspaper anymore without feeling something. Without feeling something. That's God. That's the suffering that you're experiencing through the Holy Spirit. And Paul talked about this also, entering into that place. So the challenge is, is we're taking the cross seriously and that God not only turns our power dynamics upside down when we think we're doing stuff for Jesus or, or pushing for the gospel or whatever, to put a little question mark there, or, or the Holy Spirit puts a question mark there, to look very seriously at our motives and how we're pushing. Are we using cross-shaped power, the so-called weakness of God, the foolishness of God, or are we using our own kind of ego things dressed up with crosses and little angels and, and happy faces and stuff like that? And not that our motives are bad, but it's, it's a call to examine what a cross-shaped life looks like, to examine it through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. Not only our power structures, but our beliefs about connecting and being with the Lord through our suffering or other people through their suffering. That God never gives up on people, ever. And he never withdraws his presence in that sense. We may experience it as such, but God is faithful, the Bible says. Even when we are unfaithful, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself. It's his very nature. And so the next time that you experience suffering personally, to remember that God has never given up on you and he never will. And that not only is he a friend who walks alongside of you, but he is love itself. That special kind of agape New Testament love where he takes that suffering inside of himself and helps you carry it. In fact, he takes more than his share, believe me. That there is one who has tears and a broken heart when you have tears and a broken heart. And when you minister to somebody else, somebody in your family or a friend who are going through devastating kinds of news where their life is like blown apart by some sort of landmine, and you come up to them and you hold their hand, that Jesus Christ himself, that nail-scarred hand, is holding the other hand also. And that you are not just ministering in your own sympathy or empathy, but you are ministering in the deep compassion of Jesus Christ. And to know to know that because of the cross, there is a power quite unlike anything that we could imagine, a power there for healing and grace. The cross really is a whole new way to look at life. Read the fifth chapter sometime of Paul's letter to the 2 Corinthians. The 2 Corinthians letter. Uh, there was not a 2 Corinthians. Uh, There's only one Corinthian church. But Paul talks about how everything has changed because of the cross of Christ. Everything has changed. It's like he, he uses parables about leaven, you know, fluffing up a whole bunch of bread or or a little bit of spice or salt or stuff that changes things, that everything has changed. And we're constantly learning that. But the biggest message, if you want to give the gospel to somebody, the good news is that because of the cross of Christ, they do not have to suffer alone, ever. No matter what they did, no matter how stupid they were, 
They don't have to suffer alone ever, ever, ever again. I'd like you to think about somebody in your own life who's going through some suffering, some difficult times. Just to imagine them in your mind. Maybe it's you and you see yourself. That's okay. Maybe somebody in your family who's going through a hard time right now. Yes, you can think of multiple people if you're able to do that multitask. But let's lift them up right now under the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in that cross and through that cross and under that cross there is healing, there is grace, there is goodness, there is restoration that comes out quite by surprise. Quite by surprise, oftentimes. But that's how God works. Just when we think we've got everything set up, all of our tinker toys fall down. <laughs> our best made projects. And God does something different. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for being obedient to the Father. And out of love, you endured the lash and the spit and the mocking and the cries against you. You suffered under our so-called peace, our shalom. A shalom that we use to batter you and beat you up and destroy, or at least seemingly destroy you. Help us, Jesus, Help us to have eyes wide open to see how you operate and how your cross changes everything from our power schemes to the way that we experience a connection with you. Take us deeper, Lord. Take us deeper, no matter where we are in our walk with you. Take us deeper into those places where we can know that suffering is a way that actually opens up our hearts to you and to others, to a deeper compassion, a deeper compassion. Open our eyes and ears and our spirit, Lord, to rest from all the resistance that we put up against you and against your ways when we're not comfortable. Wake us up, Lord, to a whole new way of living, from this day on, we commit ourselves to you and your cross. In Jesus' name, amen.